Hey, it's a pleasure to join you today. Thank you very much for the opportunity to Road Safety GB to come and talk to you about all things bikeability. Um, so my name's Emily Cherry and I'm the Executive Director at the Trust. Um, I've been in bikeability for around about a year now um, and absolutely loving working with our fantastic central staff team and board with our uh, wonderful bikeability industry. So our grant recipients who are local authorities and school games organisers and our training providers, many of whom are small independent companies, but also work in local authorities and SGOs and our fantastic instructors who deliver day in day out to make sure um, that bikeability can happen and of course we're really delighted to work really closely with all of our partners in other cycling organisations and the Department for Transport as, uh, as well today. So I'm going to share my screen um, so that I can talk you through all of the ways that we are engaging to make sure that bikeability for all um, is the absolute path to getting um, children and families to competent, confident cyclists. And that's definitely our mission at the Trust at the moment. So what I'm going to spend time talking to you about today is um, how we're currently delivering the programme to children and families, how we're really um, you know, pivoting and fixing onto looking at targeted training interventions for hard to reach groups, um, our new work on driver education and then sort of some thoughts that we've got about sort of future proofing um, the future of some active travel transport in terms of micro mobility. But we're really fixed at the trust on the importance of cycle training to build longer term behaviour change and increase cycling levels throughout the UK. So we were really excited with the Prime Minister's vision of gear change and being able to demonstrate the impact of when infrastructure delivers smarter cycling choices and training delivers greater confidence. We've got this once in a generation opportunity to champion um, cycling. We've got political will, we've got leadership, we've got resource um, and we're really determined to collaborate to play our part in delivering this vision. So for us at the Trust, one of the things that we've just been doing is we've just set ourselves um, a new vision and an ambitious vision. You know, the Prime Minister has committed and pledged to offer cycle training to every child and every adult by 2025. And we absolutely play a pivotal role in that. So by that point, by 2025, we would like to be able to say we've offered to five million children and adults take up bikeability training um, and thousands of families as well. And we've set ourselves um, we've set ourselves some really important strategic goals. So first of all, it's about securing the funding when the comprehensive spending review um, launches, we hope, later on in the year and to set that multi-year settlement. It's to spend a lot of time focusing on how we make sure that our delivery is the highest quality it could possibly can be. And we need to do that as well by being able to secure partnerships so that if there are barriers to taking up bikeability, we can really help children develop this as a life skill. And by the end of 2025, we'll be able to say with a great degree of confidence, we've encouraged more children and adults to cycle more confidently more often and demonstrated the impact um, of cycle training on um, a whole range of policy areas not just transport policy uh, but education curriculum the importance of health and well-being and particularly as we're in a climate emergency the role of um, clean air in the environment so there's um, some really important uh, aspects for us at the Trust at the moment. And we're really sort of wanting to sit, to, wanting to really focus on um, training absolutely as a life skill. And for me, it's those uh, words that really matter. This being a skill for life. We want to move away from some of the language and the narrative about safety and danger in, in cycling. Um, and we want to empower and build confidence from the earliest age, instilling a love and a joy for everyday normal cycling is the choice for travel. As we know, we can do that via the Bikeability Programme. So as we're um, the leading cycle training programme in England, um, delivering training as uh, for, uh, based on the national standards for cycling, as part of our vision, we're really fixed on delivering a child focused programme, but our instructors, of course, do work with adults um, and presents a great opportunity for the future. We really demonstrate quality, impact and efficiency through all of our work. Um, and we're definitely focusing to do more on tackling inclusivity. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that today. Um, and we really, really do want to collaborate. And if uh, you're listening to this and you're, you're thinking that you could support the trust or get alongside us, we'd love to hear from you as well. So we've, uh, we're really working hard at the Trust at the moment, um, uh, very much kind of coming out of the COVID pandemic, um, working with our industry to stabilise and to support them. But I think it's really important to sort of start by um, those of you be very familiar with the programme, but just sort of a few of the kind of the headlines. So we've already had three and a half million children take part. That was to the 2019-2020 year. Um, we'll be releasing uh, figures from the 2020-21 financial year um, in the next month or so. Um, and, and it's, but it's really 
really great to see that many children have already benefited from micro-ability training. We've got um, a great active network. We've got 250 training providers and currently 2,178 active instructors. So those who are actively out there delivering bikeability and we'll be launching a new instructor uh, recruitment campaign later on in the year as well. Um, thank, you to, thank you to DFT. We've managed to secure 18 million grant funding um, for this next financial year. So that will fund at least 420,000 children, but we expect the final figure to be higher than that um, in this financial year. So what a great opportunity. And we're really fixed on doing some more work around COVID recovery and catching up children um, who missed out on bikeability because of the COVID pandemic last year. But on top of that, the trust does a whole lot more um, than help to support our industry to deliver the programme. We have our own set of funding, the Innovation Fund, that we raise through sponsorship, through um, fundraising and through public donations. And that enables us to um, test and to develop new ways of bikeability or to do some of that work around inclusivity. Um, and then we also take a key role at the trust in making sure that all of the work is uh, absolutely quality, that we've got the comms and PR um, and that we're reaching out uh, to um, families and children directly through newsletters, promotions. Um, and then the last, uh, last thing on this slide is to really focus on our tools for schools work. So we've really uh, increased the amount of um, uh, uh, information and uh, there's a brilliant set of resources that are cross curriculum that uh, schools can uh, really use to help embed uh, cycle training and cycling and the love and joy of cycling as a life skill across the curriculum. So really, really good to see and to start with that. Um, so we've just launched our annual review. Um, so the annual review is a calendar year review from, for 2020, but gives the financial year data from 2019 to 2020. Um, so we trained 420,407 children together um, in the bikeability industry in the 2019-20 financial year. And that was in what we call our core modules. So our bikeabilities level one, two, and three, which help children uh, develop um, off-road skills skills and then take them to advanced and uh, advanced on-road skills and then through our plus modules um, which works with uh, families, with adults, um, with uh, balance programs, with learning to ride before entering into the core levels. So we delivered a great number of children which is absolutely fantastic but as I say we're ambitious to deliver more for the future and meet the Prime Minister's pledge. We know bikeability is really effective, so we have studies that show um, the efficacy of the programme, um, that children have a, a higher propensity to cycle on roads, that parents are, are more willing to allow them and to support them to cycle on roads, and that children's perceptions of road danger and safety are definitely improved as a result of doing bikeability training. So we know uh, the programme the, the program works um, at the fundamental level, which is uh, really, really, really important. And we'll, we're looking at some um, new research and some new evidence gathering uh, that we'll want to do over the next year to show uh, the efficacy of the programme and the impact of the programme, not, not just on children's cycling rates and uh, be, cycling to school and cycling for leisure, um, but also uh, we're very keen to look and to partner with other organisations to think about uh, the wider sort of active travel initiatives, safer routes to school, um, think about air quality, climate change, health and wellbeing, you know, all of these things we can build and embed uh, within the bikeability programme. But we absolutely know uh, that bikeability works and that that's just incredibly important. So I, I talked at the start about these words mattering, that safety and it being a life skill really, really matters. We did some work with Sustrans, um, one of our key partner organisations um, for Bike to School Week, where we surveyed uh, parents and we surveyed children and um, also Newsround put out some data in this period as well. Um, we know that cycling rates to school have stayed stubbornly low over a number of period, yet cycle ownership is on the increase and particularly with the boom in cycling sales that have been coming through this pandemic year. But 84% um, of parents surveyed don't want to drive their children to school want their children to be walking or cycling um, but it is that fear of um, the safety on roads um, on not having the infrastructure yet in place uh, to be able to encourage children to cycle is the biggest barrier and that's why the gear change vision which proposes both the training and the infrastructure together is incredibly important and I think I was really heartened to see um, very heartened to see that um, four in five parents and 72 percent of children really want to see cycling skills as a statutory part of the national curriculum it is uh, still um, difficult in some areas to get into school because of the curriculum um, and that's something that we're really really fixed on and we'd love to see it as a statutory part because it is that first step to embedding children's love and joy of cycling as a life skill and one of the other things that we've developed in this period is a brilliant video called cycle more and have fun 
um, which is a whole series of families talking about their cycling journeys and giving the Bikeability Trust top tips for safe and fun family cycling. And I definitely encourage you to go and check it out on our website or on the YouTube channel as well. Um, so we really do think that uh, to get more confident cyclists, we need to embed this within the curriculum. Um, we'd like to see at the end of the primary school curriculum that we've got children who are demonstrating the four core functions. So observation, communication, positioning and priorities, that they're able to ride on roads with moderate traffic flow and speeds and that they can negotiate um, T-junctions and roundabouts. And then by year eight, taking that on through our level three programme to be able to ride where, anywhere where cycling is permitted using infrastructure where it exists and being able to plan journeys. So we know what we want to deliver um, in terms of the curriculum requirement, and then it's, it's working with government and with parents, carers and schools to be able to um, allow this to happen for every child. But we really think delivering uh, this uh, training programme to children is about really developing that life skills and developing greater confidence through the bikeability programme. But we aren't just delivering our core levels. Um, at the Trust, we are very, very committed and focused on using our own um, set of fundraising income and sponsorship income to innovate and to do more, um, as well as work uh, with uh, Department of Transport um, on the funding places that they've got. So we've actually grant funded, we developed a whole new training programme in um, the pandemic year, um, which was called Bikeability Family, which is funding individual family household groups. And we piloted that during the pandemic year and we're now grant funding for this next financial year 5,000 family household groups. So a household being up to, to a size of six, but 5,000 families will be able to get our training. It's very bespoke training. I've done it myself. I paid for the training um, for me and my family uh, just after the lockdown period so that we could experience it. Um, it can be based on you as a family. What do you want to do? Do you want to ride for leisure? Is it about uh, getting greater confidence as it was in my family for your route to schools um, and the instructor can literally build that confidence with you as a parent to be both a role model for your children but also to practice um, those journeys that you want to do and um, we're definitely looking at some sort of future ideas around different partnerships that can build and extend that active travel experience to be able to unlock discounts awards and days out and, and things like that to encourage more active travel. On the innovation side, um, the Trust has been really uh, taking a lens around widening participation, so particularly looking at um, more vulnerable groups, more hard to reach groups and those cycling groups who aren't uh, aren't already actively engaging within bikeability or with cycle training. So uh, we've started to develop up some more sort of practical resources and advice for working with uh, BAME groups. Um, we have a new trustee uh, who's sitting on our board, who's a youth worker in Bradford, whose background is as a cycle trainer working with BAME groups, and we're working up some new advice and some new resources. And I've been hearing about some absolutely fantastic innovation in the industry um, across this uh, across this period, whether it be with um, hard to reach groups like asylum seeking and refugee children and helping them to understand the highway code and use um, use uh, cycling as a, a means of independence and, and uh, coming into this country and having that support to be able to um, integrate. Uh, so really great examples of that. I've also heard of um, fantastic work happening in people referral units with children who are much more vulnerable and not engaged in sort of mainstream education but then when you take them in um, you can develop their resilience and their confidence really vastly with a level three course so some really great um, fantastic work that's happening and I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about later on about the innovation work and the innovation funds that we um, we worked on uh, during this pandemic year for our innovation fund around special education needs and disabilities so lots of great work that's happening so we've, uh, we released uh, last year uh, so £300,000 spend um, from the Trust Innovation Fund to fund 18 pilot projects. So all local authorities and SGOs were invited to apply um, for funding. Um, and we were asking ourselves effectively three exam questions. So the first one was, um, as we're thinking about the future, we currently have a grant per head model that exists on a, a one, to, one child, one grant per head model. But actually for SEND children, there can often be other additional hidden costs, whether that be adapted equipment, additional training, at smaller ratios. Um, what are the true costs for delivering cycle training to children with SEND, both in a mainstream setting and a non-mainstream setting? We wanted to ask ourselves what training our instructors needed to feel confident to deliver with a, to a range of children with SEND and coordination disorders, and how could we then scale that up as a CPD option um, for all of our instructors across the country? And then we also wanted to take a genuine approach to innovation. So are there some new ways that we could deliver cycle training for children with SEND? Again, 
both in mainstream and non-mainstream settings. So those 18 projects have been funded till autumn uh, of this year and we've put in an evaluation approach with surveys, questionnaires and focus groups um, by Cardiff researchers in active mobility in uh, Cardiff and Oxford Brookes University. So we're going to get some really good core data that will come back out of those projects that will help our learning for the future. But I thought it might be helpful just to sort of talk you through some of the very early practice anecdote that we've been getting back from, from the projects that have been running it. Um, so I think there was there's four things really that have come back in the project reports that I've been seeing. Um, so uh, the, the first is absolutely, whilst we are committed and we will absolutely want to uh, make sure that our instructors have got more specialist knowledge about how to work with SEND children, there is also a really important role of um, SEND specialist staff with knowledge and experience and a relationship already with SEND children to support a cycling instructor when they're going out and deliver. Um, so it's, it's really important that we we think clearly and carefully um, about how we can work in partnership uh, with the great SEND specialist staff that are out there. Um, and as we're doing some more recruitment for uh, cycling instructors in the future, I hope some SEND specialist staff will come forward as well and could become trained as cycling instructors. That would, uh, that would be a fantastic opportunity. We've also heard um, from quite a few of our providers that they're, they, they're having to work quite hard um, to overcome some parent, parents' fears um, of their children cycling and building up some sort of independent skills. Um, our instructors are, were told in one area that a child would absolutely never ever be able to cycle on two wheels, would always need an adapted cycle and there was no point in, in even trying. Um, and actually the instructors worked with the parent, worked with the child and within a day, the child was cycling on two wheels. Um, but it, if we hadn't have taken the time with the parent um, to help them understand, um, to understand the child's needs uh, as well, particularly uh, that story probably wouldn't have been able to be told. So listening to parents and helping them to see what, is, what can be achieved is really vital. Um, I've also been really pleased to see some of the um, really great stuff happening around the use of BMX and particularly with pupil referral units and a real focus on developing fun first and sort of fun cycling skills through which confidence then on road cycling can kind of then be built in afterwards. Um, I think all of our bikeability programs are really fun, um, you know, level one, lots of different games and things that happen, uh, but there's something particularly for different groups and older teenagers about the use of sort of BMX um, is a quite an exciting innovation to kind of be watching and thinking about. And then the final thing that we've been hearing is early learning has been really about the flexibility of the uh, delivery programme to fit the learners needs. So not delivering a one size fits all, not um, not delivering a, a programme that says you, you must achieve these outcomes, you must do these things to, in, in order uh, to be able to, to say that that child has confidently learned to cycle, but to be a lot more flexible um, around that so that we can instill that love, that life skill um, and that confidence to cycle. So definitely a lot of core learning that we we will be taking back and I'm excited to see what the researchers at Oxford and um, uh, Oxford Brooks and Cardiff come back with um, with recommendations for us for the future. So beyond our um, SEND work, uh, we're also in this period on our family training as well. Um, we've also been leading some partnership work around driver education, which we've literally just launched. We launched it back in May and we're already getting fantastic feedback from approved driving instructors. Um, so although, uh, as, as many of you will know, cycle riding uh, riders account for less than 1% of all road traffic in the UK. Cycle traffic is definitely on the increase. Um, and there is definitely those sort of hotspots in uh, areas where the increase in cycling is much higher than the national average. Um, so we just think it was really important with uh, building in the evidence from the National Tra Travel Attitude Survey suggesting that cycling is perceived as risky still, um, with sort of around 60% of the British population agreeing or strongly agreeing that it's too dangerous to cycle on the roads. And we certainly see that from the work that we do with parents um, and their perception of road safety uh, and, and not wanting their children to cycle because of that road safety. And, and you know, we at the Trust absolutely in great infrastructure, great training, supports great cycling. Um, but of course, those statistics are not borne out in terms of safety by the statistics on road casualties, which actually point to that to, get to a decline in fatality rates. But we really thought it would be really helpful to talk to approved driving instructors and to launch um, launch a new training module that would really help them gain a better understanding of the perceptions of cycle riders and identify which cycle awareness learning resources ADIs would find uh, really helpful for preparing new drivers to share the roads with cycle riders. 
Um, so most of our approved driving instructors won't have received cycle training personally. They may not be cycling enthusiasts themselves. Um, and to be able to teach and pass on those skills and work with learner drivers is something that we thought was really important. So Department of Transport have um, funded this at what we're calling cycle savvy driving.co.uk. It is a three and a half hour practical course, which will be delivered in a small number of locations. So for 400, place, uh, 400 places have been funded in the locations that you can see on screen. Um, and that's a three and a half hour practical training course. And those are now live and running um, and recruiting for ADI. So if you do know of any improved driving instructors out there, please do share cycle savvy driving with them and they can sign up at, um, and engage with this. And then for a further um, larger number of um, ADIs, we've also got online training materials that they can do at their leisure. Um, it's got a full evaluation model behind it. So again, we'll be able to, um, to get some really core data and evidence and efficacy that will come out of this course. So a really exciting opportunity. Um, and it absolutely is focused on helping pass on to the next set of learner drivers in the country that um, real core skills about being able to share the road space respectfully and confidently with cyclists and we've already had some great feedback from ADI saying that this should be mandatory training um, was one of the comments that I saw come through on the evaluation so they think this should be something that every driving instructor does in the UK so um, that would be a, a wonderful dream to kind of make that happen but it certainly has been um, a, we're re really 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 pleased that we've been able to launch it in this period. So the final thing uh, that I wanted to sort of turn to was just to sort of start to think about the future, really. Um, and uh, micromobility has, you know, very much um, risen up in this period uh, and particularly through this last 12 month period where um, cycling has uh, become uh, more an important choice uh, for individuals to stay off public transport and to recover from the pandemic and you know, support our health and well-being. Um, micromobility has really sort of uh, grown, uh, as you all know, um, looking at data from the Bicycle Association, you know, e-bike sales are, are expected to triple um, in the next two years, already 17% of the market across the EU. Halfords in, in, I think it was in a three week period, um, reported a 450% increase in e-scooter sales. Um, and then of course, this uh, the e-scooter trials have had really strong initial take up um, in many areas. And we're excited to see the opportunities um, that, that develop um, as a result of the e-scooter trials. But we are in a place where people are still massively confused by the law. Um, whilst we wait uh, for the, the trials to complete and uh, for DFT to assess the evidence and then look at any kind of legal position around e-scooters and e-bikes, um, we're getting a lot of feedback from providers that secondary school use is significantly growing. Um, I, I, I see it a lot uh, with my, my own children going to school. I see a number of under 16 year olds traveling on the road without helmets on e-scooters. And there absolutely is, is, is definitely just that real sort of public perception um, and not understanding of the law in respect to e-scooters. So whilst there's a lot of um, uh, movement in this area, for us at the Trust, what we would really want to focus on now is we think that the national standards have done an awful lot of great for cycling and cycling and, and the path to confident and competent cyclists. We now need to look at national standards for cycling that have that can be also be trained via micromobility. Um, that is a piece of work that is ongoing. Uh, there are already um, some individual providers who are in the uh, trials that are requiring information and requiring training um, to be part of the trial area and we applaud that and we welcome that and we are working with a number of those providers. Um, to be able to give them expert advice around how to train that. We also know many of the um, e-scooter trial area providers uh, really value the role of bikeability instructors and our level two cycling instructors in delivering some of that training. And we've got um, a fantastic partnership um, with Beryl uh, and down in Bournemouth and Poole, uh, they've literally just been training some bikeability instructors on um, e-scooters and then they can go out and do training uh, for the public as well on those. So these are great partnerships that can develop up for the future as um, micromobility is definitely one of the future uh, modes of transport that, that we, we think will be really useful. And then we're also um, working at the Trust on making sure that via our Tools for Schools programme, schools and head teachers um, know and understand about e-scooter legality use and then we can point them direct when uh, the, when training is available to training opportunities to support the safety and the skill um, of individual users. 
but we do think there needs to be a public education programme. So um, very keen on forms of micro mobility, definitely the future, uh, but we would very much recommend at the Trust that there needs to be both the national standard and, the tr and training as a requirement so that we can really get um, not just competent cyclists and, and road cyclists, but um, all forms of micro mobility in the future will have that path to really confident, safe cycling. So in terms of us at the Trust um, uh, right now and uh, the next next year, as it currently stands in 2021, um, we are continuing to cover from uh, recover from COVID. Um, COVID uh, has been difficult for so many of us um, in so many different ways. And we are getting alongside our industry and making sure they can um, reactivate in some places and recover from the impact of the pandemic. Um, booking and demand for bikeability is really significantly up um, and our training providers are working, especially hard to make sure that they can fill that demand uh, both for the grant funded bikeability but also for um, privately funded bikeability which does happen as well um, and we, we definitely encourage that as we um, uh, receive the will later on receive funding for every child but right now um, there are opportunities to purchase bikeability so that every child can be reached. But we're also taking a big focus on quality and support. Um, so making sure that wherever bikeability is delivered, it's delivered uh, both to the delivery guide, but also to the uh, highest level of quality so that those confident and competent cyclists can really be grown um, over the over the programme. And we can see the impact of that translate then into um, higher levels of active travel in children and parents. Uh, we're also doing a lot of work to help our training providers to scale and grow. Um, we uh, know that we are delivering higher levels of bikeability in this financial year, and then we will have targets um, in the previous in the next years uh, to be able to hit uh, hit. So we'll need more instructors, and we'll need to scale up our businesses to be able to cope with higher levels of demand and greater numbers of school and children. So we're getting alongside them, and we've got a new business industry manager um, who's helping our training providers to scale and to grow, um, which is a fantastic opportunity. And then we'll be shortly launching with the department um, a instructor bursary scheme. So we know that we'll need um, a, a good number of instructors over the next 12 months to enter the industry, both to counter those who may be looking to retire um, from the bikeability industry, but also um, to make sure that we can meet that increased demand and then get to the PM's ambition for every child. So we'll be launching the bursary scheme, which um, not only will that be able to support local areas to be able to meet demand in the local area, but we'll also be taking a focus on equality, diversity and inclusion and um, improving the uh, workforce um, equality and diversity so that we've got uh, instructors who reflect the communities that they work in. So those are some of our key plans for 2021. Um, I, I said earlier that we've just launched our annual review. Um, I'd encourage you to go and check it out either on the Bikeability website or on the link on these slides. Um, the annual review tells the calendar year uh, story of COVID and just some absolutely wonderful stories of how our industry has really risen to the challenge of making sure that as many children as possible can get bikeability and we are deeply deeply grateful to everyone who's been involved whether as a partner an instructor a training provider or a grant recipient very grateful for everything that everyone has done to make bikeability happen and we're very excited about what the future and our partnership holds uh, to be able to reach that ambition for every child um, I'm always open for uh, coffees and well virtual coffees um, and discussions so very keen to hear from people if you've got ideas ideas about how we can um, future develop our innovation work um, or some future research and areas that you may want to collaborate on or if you've got ideas for partnerships and how we can tackle some of those barriers to bikeability like access to bikes um, and particularly in areas of deprivation then I would absolutely be delighted to hear from you. Um, so thank you for the time, uh, thank you for the opportunity to come and speak and uh, we really look forward to working with everyone out there in the cycle training industry um, and I hope you're all well and take care. Thank you.